verse tonight to chapter 35 having dealt with the first eight verses the 42 general cities of the Levites and their limited territory in a land where they had no inheritance to these six cities of refuge we begin our reading therefore at Numbers 35 and verse 9 but perhaps we should first take a glance at verse 6 which says the cities which you give to the Levites shall be the six cities of refuge and then from verse 9 the Lord said to Moses say to the people of Israel when you cross the Jordan into the land of Canaan then you shall select cities to be cities of refuge for you that the manslayer who kills any person without intent may flee there the cities shall be for you a refuge from the avenger that the manslayer may not die until he stands before the congregation for judgment and the cities which you give shall be your six cities of refuge you shall give three cities beyond the Jordan, that's east of in Transjordan, of course, and three cities in the land of Canaan to be cities of refuge. These six cities shall be for refuge for the people of Israel and for the stranger and for the sojourner among them, that anyone who kills any person without intent may flee there. But if he struck him down with an instrument of iron so that he died, he is a murderer. That murderer shall be put to death. And if he struck him down with a stone in the hand by which a man may die, and he died, he is a murderer. The murderer shall be put to death. Or if he struck him down with a weapon of wood in the hand by which a man may die, and he died, he is a murderer. The murderer shall be put to death. The avenger of blood shall himself put the murderer to death. When he meets him, he shall put him to death. And if he stabbed him from hatred or hurled at him lying in wait so that he died, or in enmity struck him down with his hand so that he died, then he who struck the blow shall be put to death. He is a murderer. The avenger of blood shall put the murderer to death when he meets him. But if he stabbed him suddenly without enmity, that's an astonishing allowance, isn't it? If he stabbed him suddenly without enmity, or hurled anything on him without lying in wait, or used a stone by which a man may die, and without seeing him cast it upon him so that he die, though he was not his enemy, and did not seek his harm. Then the congregation shall judge between the manslayer and the avenger of blood, in accordance with these ordinances. And the congregation shall rescue the manslayer from the hand of the avenger of blood, and the congregation shall restore him to his city of refuge to which he had fled. And he shall live in it, until the death of the high priest who was anointed with the holy oil. But if the manslayer shall at any time go beyond the bounds of his city of refuge to which he fled, and the avenger of blood finds him outside the bounds of his city of refuge, and the avenger of blood slays the manslayer, he shall not be guilty of blood. For the man must remain in his city of refuge until the death of the high priest. But after the death of the high priest, the manslayer may return to the land of his possession. And these things shall be for a statute and ordinance to you throughout your generations in all your dwellings. If anyone kills a person, the murderer shall be put to death on the evidence of witnesses, but no person shall be put to death on the testimony of one witness. Moreover, you shall accept no ransom for the life of a murderer who is guilty of death, 
but he shall be put to death. And you shall accept no ransom for him who has fled to his city of refuge, that he may return to dwell in the land before the death of the high priest. You shall not thus pollute the land in which you live, for blood pollutes the land, and no expiation can be made for the land, for the blood that is shed in it except by the blood of him who shed it. You shall not defile the land in which you live, in the midst of which I dwell. For I, the Lord, dwell in the midst of the people of Israel. Amen. And thanks be to God. The second passage of Numbers 35 is concerned exclusively with the cities of refuge. Now, from the 48 cities of the Levites, these six designated places of refuge were to be selected. Now, that's easily said and quite quickly said, but we have to understand what lies behind it. If you can cast your minds back, those of you who were here a fortnight ago, we spoke of the 42 general cities of refuge scattered throughout the land, spread throughout the nation, being there so that the Levites were separated to God. And they acted like salt in the lump, like leaven through the lump of dough. They were there to hold the whole people to God and to bring the grace of God to the people. Now it was from that scattering throughout the land that these six cities of refuge were to be selected. Do you remember that the Levites faced separation to God in order to serve God? In that sense, the Levites stand as a picture of the church of Jesus Christ separated to God in order to serve God. They stand in particular as a picture of the ministry within the church where there must be an element of separation in order to serve. The Levites, says the book of Deuteronomy, had a function of teaching and preaching the Scriptures, teaching and preaching the Word of God. That was how they acted as the glue that held the people of God together by holding them themselves to God. These Levites paid a price then. They knew what separation unto service was. And we spoke, I think quite rightly, of the loneliness of the Levites. They ministered the word to the people of God. They led the people in worship and they held them together for God by holding them up to God. But from the 48 cities or in addition to the 42 general places they were given to live throughout the land, they were to select six special places. These also were chosen so that there was a spread of them, so that they were accessible to everyone within the nation. They even extended across the Jordan into the two and a half tribes who stayed there. They were chosen for a special purpose. Now the special purpose could be summed up in the verses of this chapter that speak of blood guiltiness that speak of the land being polluted by blood. At the end of the chapter we read, You shall not thus pollute the land in which you live, for blood pollutes the land, and no expiation can be made for the land, for the blood that is shed in it, except by the blood of him who shed it. Now the cities of refuge were there so that this should not happen so that God would be able to live amongst his people and be found in their midst. They were there to keep the land free from the blood guilt of the taking of human life. 
They were there to maintain the purity of the inheritance of Israel tribe by tribe. But that's not all that they were there for. Within that there is a deeper purpose in the selection of these six particular cities of refuge. If you like, there is something beyond that purpose. These cities stood for the fundamental things of the gospel. These cities were like six pictures of the purposes of God. And they spoke of something basic and urgent and vital in God's purposes for his people. They have to do with sin and forgiveness. They have to do with grace and a covenant of mercy. Now, there will come a time, I hope, when we will be able to look at the cities of refuge, these six cities, as people normally would look at them and understand them. You find them mentioned, of course, also in the book of Joshua and twice at least in the book of Deuteronomy. But I want to avoid that jumping into the normal interpretation of these passages because this passage in Numbers has a particular purpose that sets it aside from the others. Now the particular application has to do with what it says about the high priest, the anointed high priest and his death. And if you hold that in mind you'll see what I mean in a moment or two. The cities of refuge were like places of asylum. They were like medieval places of sanctuary provided for the manslayer, though clearly the chapter teaches not for the murderer. They are places where the man who had inadvertently and unintentionally taken human life to flee until his case could be tested by the people of God. But they are not places of refuge for those who did this deliberately, who murdered rather than killed. Now this distinction is an important one and is a thoroughly biblical one. And this distinction also has to do with our salvation Hold on to that and I'll try to show you how it fits in in a moment. This morning we were sharing the, the Ten Commandments as they are given, first of all, in Exodus chapter 20. But you know, the distinction under the commandment, Thou shalt not kill, between murder and the taking of human life unintentionally, comes almost immediately after the giving of the Ten Commandments. You find it, for example, in Exodus 21. You find it in the book of Deuteronomy, quite some way after the giving of the Ten Commandments in that record. But in chapter 19 you find the same distinction made between murder and manslaughter. And it is an important distinction. The provision of these six cities then was meant to, pre to prevent the horrors of blood feuds. They were meant to prevent vengeance taking and the whole thing getting out of hand so that it was not only the lex talionis of an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth, but it became almost a civil war amongst God's people. And it did from time to time to their shame. But the provision of these cities was intended that that should not happen. It's a provision, therefore, of mercy. A person who had caused a death could run to one of these places and there always had to be one within a day's journey. That's one of the regulations. And there he would wait until the congregation of God's people decided whether his case was one of manslaughter or murder. And if in the findings of the people of God he had killed unintentionally, then he was safe within the walls of the city and the kinsman avenger of blood could not harm him. There was a higher law than the law of vengeance for the manslayer. And the city of refuge provided that safety and that freedom from fear that he needed. 
Now this is established in the opening verses that we read tonight from verse 9 to verse 15. And having established it, the difference and the distinction between manslaughter and murder is now defined and explained through various examples. You find the examples of murder in verses 16 to 21, and then you find the examples of manslaughter in verses 22 and 23. But the decision as to whether it was a case of the one or the other was in the hands neither of the accused nor of the accuser. Neither in the hands of the man who protested innocence, nor in the avenger of blood who wanted justice. It was in the hands of the congregation. This is what a philosopher or a lawyer might call natural justice. But there really is no such thing. Because natural justice is simply a way of describing the justice of God. Now, if it then be judged that it was the first, if it was murder, then the avenger of blood had the right and the responsibility, in fact, of execution. Now, that execution was, of course, within strict controls and within certain limitations, as you can see hinted at from verse 30 onwards. But if, on the other hand, it was judged that this was manslaughter, then the city of refuge was the place of life and safety for the accused. Now, what makes this chapter different from Joshua and Deuteronomy is the key verses that you find, first of all, as verse 25, where it says that he shall live there, at the end of verse 25, until the death of the high priest who was anointed with the holy oil. That is the key statement of the chapter. It's a statement which, of course, is repeated. But what does it mean? What does it mean that this man should be there until the death of the high priest and then he was free to go? Well, in terms of historical fact, it means just what it says. It meant that the that when the anointed high priest of Israel, during whose term of office the accused man was given refuge in the city, when that high priest died, all claims of guilt by blood, all blood guiltiness that lay upon the person living in the city of refuge were removed. They were finished. That's what it meant as a historical fact. But what does it mean at a deeper level? And what does it mean for us? What does it mean now? Well, it seems to me to be short-sightedness to the point of blindness to say that this is simply an amnesty. You know, when a new king comes to the throne, or a new government comes into power, there's a tendency to release political prisoners. During the Velvet Revolution just a few years ago now, all criminals in Czechoslovakia, almost all actually, were freed. It was a very foolish thing to do. Because in towns in the south like Česky Budjavice, it caused untold damages. People who were in prison, not for political uh, crimes at all, but for criminal activities, were released. But it tends to be the case, doesn't it, that there's a, an amnesty offered particular to, particularly to political prisoners at the time of a new regime. Now, it seems to me to be blindness to say that this is simply a new authority coming in and it's an amnesty. It's far, far more than that. And to say that it's simply a matter of amnesty is to miss the significance of the person whose death brings release, that is the high priest, of whom it is said twice in this chapter, he was the high priest because he is the anointed one. The Christed one, literally. You see, to say that this is simply amnesty is to miss the significance of the whole thing. 
a significance that is stressed here in this chapter. You see, you will give me that the whole legal system that you find in the Old Testament, the legal system that is at the heart of the Old Testament, at the heart of the people of God in the Old Testament, is itself a picture of salvation. You give me that, I'm sure you, you agree with that. Certainly you must agree that the sacrificial system of worship is a picture of salvation. It's a shadow. The reality which casts that shadow is the cross of Christ and all it stands for. Given that, given that the legal system, the sacrificial system is a shadow of God's purpose and plan which would only be completed in the perfect death of Jesus Christ, then it's gross blindness to say that this is amnesty and no more. Given also that the great high priest in the Old Testament is a shadow of the great high priest who the New Testament says is none other than Jesus of Nazareth, the Son of God. Then not to see the significance of this is to be blind indeed. The great high priest in the Old Testament finds all that he is and all that he is meant to speak of fulfilled and spoken of finally in the death of Jesus Christ, the great high priest, the Son of God. And if that's so, then the death here in Numbers 35 of the high priest which brings release and freedom and a new innocence for the accused is a picture of what the death of Jesus Christ does for us. The meaning of the whole thing is found in the way the death of Jesus brings release and freedom and a new innocence for all who through repentance and faith entrust themselves to God in his name. It is through the death of the high priest, the great high priest, Jesus Christ, that we are liberated from the penalty of the law, that we are liberated from the power and the penalty of sin which is death, and by which one day we shall be released even from the presence of sin when we come to God in glory. Do you see this? The anointed one, the great high priest, when he dies, brings pardon, a full pardon that liberates the prisoner, brings cleansing and a freedom and a new life by dying. Only the death of another can atone for forfeited life. And this is something unique in the scriptures. Only the death of the anointed high priest of Israel can atone. No one else's death would do. No man can ransom his brother, says the Old Testament. No one can give his life for another in the sense that the giving of that life will mean forgiveness and a satisfaction of the justice and the mercy of God. And yet there's a unique thing here. A unique significance in the death of one man as the high priest of Israel dies. The manslayer is declared innocent and he is free to go to go back into a fullness of life and into his inheritance amongst the people of God. Only the death of another and only the death of the high priest of God can bring these things to be. Now this is the meaning within the whole meaning of the cities of refuge. This is the stress of Numbers 35, and this is why we wanted to look at this 
this thing, this one glorious truth, this truth concerning the death of the anointed one, before we look at the other significances of the cities. This, I believe, is what God the Father wants us to lay hold upon by faith. As you read Numbers 35 and as we share this chapter in worship tonight, it's as if the Holy Spirit of God says to us again, get hold of this, get hold of this. Grasp the wonder of this. Get hold of the significance of this and apply it to your life and be what I have made you. Be free and live a life in which you know the power of forgiveness. Because you know the power of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. I think that's how Paul might put it. The death and the resurrection of Jesus Christ is the only provision made for our sin. The perfect and the unique provision for all our sins. Now this, in a particular way, is underlined by the strict command not to accept any ransom payment for guilt. Now you'll notice how particular this is. Because in verses 32 and 33, it says that not only must you not accept a payment as ransom for the murderer, which would be wrong, but neither should you accept payment as ransom for the manslayer. Money won't do it. Nothing will do it. The death of the anointed priest alone can bring release. And what does this say if it doesn't say to us that atonement is costly? That the forgiveness of our sins, that the covering of our sins so that they are washed away completely, means a death, means the shedding of human blood. This is therefore saying that nothing less than the death of the anointed one is acceptable to God. Nothing else will bring forgiveness. Nothing else means life. Nothing other than or less than this means peace for us. Doesn't it speak both of the value and of the sanctity of human life? And doesn't it speak of the cost of redemption? No ransom will do. The only ransom is in the death of the anointed one. In the death, ultimately, of course, of Jesus Christ. I suppose I should have said long ago that the explanation for this is built into the very beginnings of things. In Genesis chapter 9, you know, the giving of the covenant and all that. It says this at verse 5, Genesis 9 and 5. For your lifeblood, I will surely require a reckoning. Of every beast I will require it, and of man, of every man's brother, I will require the life of man. And it says here in verse 6, Whoever sheds the blood of man, by man shall his blood be shed. Why? Because God made man in his own image. Do you begin to see the depth of all this and the significance that it bears? Jesus, remember, taught us that even to hate another is to break the commandment, Thou shalt not kill, for in your heart you have committed murder. Do you see that we all need this? And that it's no use standing before God saying, Well, I'm not such a terrible person. I've never actually killed anyone. Or not intentionally. Now, Let's take up this thing again, that there is no provision for the murderer. There is no city of refuge for the one who meant to kill. 
who intended to kill, who deliberately took life. There is no mercy for him, and yet there is mercy for the manslayer. Can I ask you to cast your minds back through our studies in the book of Numbers? Do you remember we were away back in Numbers chapter 15? And we saw there that the Bible makes a distinction between what it calls sin with a high hand and the sins of ignorance. Do you remember how Israel was warned there, sadly warned just before she went ahead and did sin with a high hand? But do you remember how Israel was warned there not to sin presumptuously? That the sins of frailty and the sins of ignorance could be brought to God, but the sin of presumption was an awful thing. Now let us put it this way. Totally presumptuous sin is unforgivable. Now that might be shocking to you if you think that all sin is forgivable. What do you say to a little child who comes to you and says, Mum or Dad, can the devil not be saved? The answer to this is that Satan cannot be saved because he is a totally rebellious spirit. Because his sin against the light of God was a totally presumptuous sin, a sin committed with a high hand. But human sin is seldom totally deliberate. Now, I don't know whom Jesus meant when he said, Father, forgive them, they know not what they do. It's not clear whether he meant the soldiers or those around him or those who had brought him into condemnation. In one sense, it's better that we do not know that he meant any particular circle of people at all. Because, you know, those words, Father, forgive them, they know not what they do, indicates our frailty and causes us to bring to God the sin that can be forgiven. You see, in one sense, of course, everyone around the cross knew what they were doing. But in another sense, they could not fully know what they were doing. They could not understand the awful meaning of their actions. Their sin was therefore forgivable. You know, this is where we have to be very careful with language. It is quite easy to get excited and carried away and to speak about the death of Christ in language which the Bible just does not and will not use. It's quite easy to speak of people murdering Jesus. Now that is not said. Even Peter, when he is bringing the nation of Israel before its guilt and before its God, does not use those particular words that accuses them of murder in the taking of the life of Jesus, in the slaying of their own Messiah. Father, forgive them. Their sin was within the bounds of forgiveness. And our sin, while let's not underestimate its significance, while it is still sin, Our sin is seldom, if ever, unmixed with blindness and ignorance. Therefore, it is forgivable upon repentance to God through faith in Jesus Christ. Now, that is one of the things that the cities of refuge indicate. That is why the difference and distinction between manslaughter and murder is found here. Let me just say in passing that of course there were, there were significant things that were said of these cities. We've said that each one of them had to be placed in such a way so that every tribe of Israel 
from every region of their inheritance could find their way to a city within one day's travel. Not only that, but the regulations came to be stated like this, that the highways, that the main passageways to the cities of refuge must be kept clear, and every tribe had a responsibility to keep the road to the city of refuge which applied to it clear and open. It was also stated in time that the indications as to where these cities were to be found had to be plain and clear. They had to be signposted. And it's also stated here in Numbers 35 and elsewhere in Joshua and in Deuteronomy that access was not limited to the child of the nation of Israel but went on to include their servants, their slaves and the sojourners and travelers through the land. It was universally open to all. Now, if what I'm saying is right, and you know it's right, that the significance of the city of refuge is found in the cross of Jesus Christ, then it points us to our functions in the church. We are meant as the church of Christ to declare a gospel of forgiveness upon repentance and faith in Jesus. We must state that clearly. The way to the city of refuge, the way to the cross must be kept clear. The signs must be plain. We have to see to it that we are preaching a plain message. That we are truly indicating the need for and the availability of all the grace of God in Jesus Christ. We must make it plain that here is refuge, here is forgiveness, that he is the one and the only one through whom peace can be made with God. We must point people plainly to Christ. And if the path to that cross becomes obstructed by anything, no matter how dearly we hold it as a tradition or something we like to do or to have in our midst, if that gets in the way, we surely must be prepared to clear it out. Neither dare we ever preach an exclusive message. We must declare access to the city of refuge, access to the cross of Jesus Christ for all who will come. Now our task is to raise the cross of Christ amongst us and to hold out a Savior to the world that God has given in His Son. And the way must be clear to Him. The signs must be made plain. And there must be access for all. But, says Numbers 35, we mustn't get caught up in putting these things first. The first thing is this. That it is Christ who is the refuge of sinners. It is Christ who is the peace of God. It is Jesus who is Savior. And who therefore means safety for all who come to him. In Christ, as in a city of refuge, we are safe from guilt and judgment. And in his death, the death of the anointed one, we are liberated and given a new innocence. A new life. Now this is not escapism. To run to Jesus Christ for refuge is not to hide from the world. Although he knows and understands how often you and I have to run to him. And ask again that we might feel and know the power of his love for us to comfort us when we are down and troubled and weary and afraid but it's not escapism to run to Christ 
It is the opposite. We spoke of the Levites as those separated to serve God. Well, here is the essence of their service. What do I mean? The Levites were separated to serve. They were to teach God's law. They were to lead and maintain the worship of God so that they held the people of God together and held them to God. And it was these people whose function was to do these things who provided the cities of refuge. Coming to Christ is not merely an intellectual thing. It is not merely something that goes on inside our hearts and minds and wills, although it does. Coming to Christ means a bringing of ourselves to Him, like running to the city of refuge for our security and peace. Now there are always arguments around this area, but this is why, for example, the Billy Graham organization asks people to step forward because they say in the physical getting up and walking forward, there is an act of commitment that is bringing the life to Christ. Now I would say that it's the reality of coming to Christ, not the actual walking forward that matters, and you can have the one without the other. You can walk forward at a crusade and not be converted. And you cannot walk forward and yet be converted. But they're right, you know, in pointing out that coming to Christ is not just intellectual. It is a real movement and indicates the need for a real and visible change. Now, Christ is present amongst his people. Our Lord is at work in and through his people. And it is for Christians together in the church of Christ, it is for the living body of believers to be what Numbers 35 calls for. To be what the cities of refuge stand for. Didn't we hear the words of our Savior not so long ago say that we are the light of the world and the salt of the world? Doesn't he say that a city set on a hill cannot be hid, indicating that it must not be hid? And what was he thinking of? Perhaps he was even thinking of the cities of refuge. We are to be together what the city of refuge stood for. As Christians bound together in the Lord Jesus Christ, we are to be cities of refuge. Places to which people can run, knowing that there they will find forgiveness and peace through the death of the Anointed One. You see, the key to the chapter, in a sense, is found not only in the death of the high priest, but the statement in the, at the end, I, the Lord, dwell in the midst of the people of Israel. We are to be like cities of refuge where the guilty can come and find Christ amongst his people. The great high priest who has died and has been raised by the power of the Father and lives to intercede constantly. Now, if we want to be that, then we have to be what the Levites were, a people separated to God, prepared to be spread throughout the world. This is why I sometimes am a bit anxious about huge Christian gatherings which very often function as little else than sources of comfort and encouragement. All very well. But we are meant to function in the local congregation in the West Parish Church and you, my brother and sister, who have joined us from other churches tonight in your place. 
We are meant to function as cities of refuge scattered throughout the people, the salt and the light and the city on the hill. We are meant to be a place of refuge where people can come and know Christ available for the forgiveness of their sins. And if we want to be that, we must be separated to God from the people who were separated that they might serve God, came the cities of refuge. They were a blessing to the people. In a sense, if we are to be a blessing to this world and be places or gatherings of people where Christ is found, then we too must be like the Levites, a picture of the one through whose separation in his death sinners were united again to God through forgiveness. Do you see? Are we, do we want to be a city of refuge, a people of blessing? Then we must be prepared to be separated to God. But is this not the calling of every Christian and every Christian community, every church and local congregation? This is our calling. That in our midst Christ who is our peace might be found. And I hope that with me you really do want to seek this. To be this to our community and to our world. To be a place where Christ is found. A city of refuge. Amen. Let's close our service in singing this hymn, but noticing the great truths, especially of verse 3, Jesus, our great high priest who offered his blood and died. Hymn number 165, join all the glory of